Good to see you back for my conversation with Bernhard Bauhofer on reputation management. What does it take to create it and what does it take, more importantly, to keep it in the long run? I think it's key in, in the course of a digital transformation that depending on, on your nature and the history of your business, that you have to understand to what extent you have to go into this so kind of a new world, social media, with which velocity and key is that you take your stakeholders with you. Just for our viewers that might not speak German, um, there is this kind of marshmallow sweet Yeah. Uh, and it's chocolate coated and they are super delicious. I grew up with them and you, <laughs> you know, once you start with one, you can't stop. But the point is when I was little, they were called translated Negro kisses. Okay. And uh, that was then after a while seen as politically incorrect. So they had to also rebrand and they call them now chocolate kisses or cream kisses or whatever, because of the, the marshmallow inside. And, um, Again, as a child, I was never thinking about it. As a child, you might not, but I never felt that there was this kind of environment. Do you actually think that Migro, you know, after that one Twitter tweet, did the right thing of rebranding, which is a huge exercise, which is very, very costly, but perhaps short-term costly, long-term beneficial? No, they just threw the, this brand out of the shelves. Um, I think that was a, a wrong decision because they didn't understand the importance the meaning of this brand to the, the Swiss people. And uh, Migro is now, I would say, the incorporation of a Swiss company. Um, but they are, and I think that the problem with Migro goes much deeper. Uh, they didn't understand the sensitivity of that decision. And they could have dealt this also from occasional point of view um, differently, more in, in a dialogue with the manufacturer, right? If we look at this, I would say we're just, we're just touching the surface of, of a much deeper problem. If you really want to go responsibility, you have to look, look at the traceability of products. Where do the products come from, the ingredients? You have to look at the circumstances, how this is being produced in emerging markets. If child labor is involved, how and then this is truly true criticism uh, shareholder or stakeholder activism but just criticizing company by by this is is a very easy task right and one has to consider the the impact on 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 yeah. The absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's such a crucial point you make because one thing is whatever I do as a company, but I actually have to go deeper and look at all my shareholders, all my supply chain, how do exactly. they deal with their employees, with nature, how they're producing and even transporting whatever arrives to me. Uh, because again, inconsistency, we touched about it uh, on it earlier on, is something that people activists may pick up on. And just to conclude on, on Mars, there was a very uh, interesting from, from the communications officer here, uh, the global president of Mars Food, actually, she made the following comment. She said, we listen to our associates and our customers, uh, and the time is right to make meaningful changes across society. Um, her name is Fiona Dawson. And she said, when you are making these changes, you are not going to please everyone. So again, this is what you were saying. You thought Migros' decision to just throw out a product uh, was mm -hmm. too short term. It was just perhaps an overreaction driven by fear. But she says, but it's about doing the right thing not the easy thing. And I think this is something that is almost a life, a life philosophical point. Moving on, and I would like to um, go a little bit deeper, if I may, Bernard, into online reputation management. You mm -hmm. were talking right at the beginning of our conversation about the complexity of the world, and meaning we are now all interwoven, all interconnected, and whatever we say, we may say so that globally we are heard on all the platforms. So the multi-channel platform um, strategy is something that I'm guessing you also have to do with your clients. It's absolutely no. I think if you look at where the clients spend their time, right? Um, they don't spend the time in um, bricks and mortar shops anymore. <laughs> they are shopping online. Uh, they are spending their time in, in forums, um, on, on websites, um, uh, and all that kind of shows that this is now absolutely crucial. Um, the so-called touch points uh, are online, and that's key. So this impacts that you have to have a very good 
responsive website, you have to track it with uh, SEO, so uh, search engine optimization. You have to make sure you also, and depending on the industry, of course, but more and more, it's inevitable to be on LinkedIn as a, with a corporate uh, account, and then you should be on, on Instagram and possibly even to, despite the negative reputation of, of Facebook on Facebook and so forth, though this is key. But you know what? Um, I think it's key in, in the course of a digital transformation that depending on, on your nature and the history of your business, that you have to understand to what extent you have to go into this kind of a new world, social media, with which velocity and key is that you take your stakeholders with you. Because if they are accustomed that you meet them personally, uh, if you send your sales guy to, to a personal meeting, um, if you really pick up the phone when somebody is calling and all of a sudden everything is happening online, then there is a reputational uh, if I would say shock, but they are have to understand what's going on now. Yeah. This is depending much on, on, on the age of the uh, of your of your clientele, of your stakeholders. So you do have to be online, that's for sure. But the, the transformation process is key, and you have yeah, to. And there's a the personal that. touch that you need, I guess. The yeah, absolutely, and you have to. And, and you know, if I I just published as you as you recently mentioned this Corona booklet, I was talking to a, a traditional publisher. And he said, listen, Bernard, which I published earlier books, and I said, listen, if, I like that topic a lot, but I'm not, I'm, we don't have the necessity, we don't have the people, we are offline, we cannot work. So I published a book on book on demand. I didn't have a single contact with a person with a phone call. It was done everything online. I published my own songs. It's done online. So you don't need anyone in this point. Now, now we come to the, the critical point. You have to have this personal touch. You have to have this emotional experience. And you do. And the companies want you to create a bond with their brands and their companies. And how do you do that on, on, in this online point? You have to, to be quite savvy to understand how the customer, the consumer in the online world is ticking and how you capture him. And in a negative sense, if there is a crisis, that you really care and you respond on with a personal touch. Right? Absolutely. By and using so artificial technology and all te uh, intelligent all technology which is available, of course. But you have to combine this with the with your values and, and, and the personal uh, approach, right? Yeah, and I think it's really critical what you're saying because it's the empathy factor. So let's say you're criticized and you're criticized online for everybody to be seen. I think it's critical the way the company responds, A, how fast, and B, with how much empathy and understanding and also perhaps with the promise of we are going to sort it out and thank you very much for your comment. Absolutely, and, um, and, and it has to be... This means uh, this means that you have to delegate people to do that 24 hours, seven days, particularly if you are a globally uh, working, operating company, right? So because the consumer never sleeps um, and they want an instant response, the way they are receiving responses from their mates and peers through WhatsApp and whatsoever. And you have to use the channel the client requires and is accustomed to. So this means a complete different... Um, approach to customer relationship management yeah. uh, and um, and of course you have to see how you can do that with uh, with the help of um, of uh, artificial intelligence but at the same time you have to deploy people real people and if you outsource this to a uh, third party company uh, it might not convey the values the way you communicate yeah. Um, the way it should be and customs are used to from the real world or from other instances, right? So you have to make sure that there is a consistency in communication and what you're saying also of the internality. Yeah, and what, what you're mentioning there is you need to know your customers, you need to know your platform, you need to know your value and what you want to communicate and you have to, you know, kind of combine all of this and there is a exactly. big complexity. And just to kind of wrap up this part of the conversation talking about online reputation management, I want to again uh, do a screen share simply because it really shows you from a, you know, customer user experience side what we are, all of us, but especially companies are facing. Let me just... Go back to the screen share. Okay, this is what I would like to share. 
And these are review statistics about uh, reputation and how important really your ratings as a customer can become for a company. And I know it's a lot to read, so let me just quickly uh, read you through the most important aspects here, which I pulled out. Uh, of course, flabbergasting in some respect, 85% of cons consumers actually do trust online reviews and they will take them at the same level as, you know, Bernard, hey, go to that restaurant. You trust me, Patricia, so you will go. Same sort of thing, even though it's through technology and it comes from somebody that might be a totally unreliable source. Maybe a troll, uh, you never know. 60% of consumers say the negative re reviews actually made them not do something. So again, buyer be aware and corporation be aware. 49% of consumers need at least a four-star rating to do anything or perhaps choose that hotel, that uh, whatever supplier, what have you. And every additional one-star Yelp rating, now that really shocked me, did not know, causes an increase in the business revenue as high as 9%. So, you know, you have five stars, that's good for your revenue, it goes down, of course, you will see it in the bottom line. And this is why your job, Bernard, is so important and more importantly, uh, in, in, or more important in the future, simply because there is more and more with Corona as well, that be created online and we have to just trust what we see in terms of clicks and stars and ratings. And reviews uh, that only have one or two stars fail to convert by 86% into positive customers. So here, not only the rating, but, but also the non-rating really has a big impact. And I just wonder how you can keep all of these platforms, pl platforms on track um, on a day-to-day -day basis. That, that's huge. That really is huge. Yeah, well, it, it all starts with your, your, with your services and products and the quality they are really giving. I think uh, you can build up to some extent with fake um, posts and fake reviews a, a certain... Nah, so risk, online risk. reputation, but at the same time, I think people and consumers are, they, they see the patterns of, of a review and see, look, if there is, a, I would say like 60% negative one point reviews, and then you have all of a sudden 40% five star reviews, and they say, listen, this is not pretty credible. <laughs> there must be something behind it. But you know, in the online world, that's the only sources we can trust and we can refer to because we have no personal friends saying, listen, this is a fantastic restaurant, you have to go there. It's a personal rec recommendation is still key. So you have to, you really have to trust and take this as a reference. But at the same time, people are uh, not stupid. Consumers can really read between the lines, I'm quite sure. If this is a true uh, assessment of critical consumers or if this is maybe bought uh, reviews, which already do. I think that's a big, big um, danger for companies to do to hire people, students, which we already seen also in Switzerland, who give positive reviews in order to push uh, a company's reputation and their, its perception and, and, um, and make customers believe this is true and buy the products. Though I think this is also an ethical point of view, to be honest. Uh, do you want to be perceived positive? Also, your, your services are crap, right? And uh, it will be discovered. And we had press exactly detecting these kind of um, false policies, right? And yeah. um, this is also coming back to the corporate culture. Do we, do we need to do that? Does somebody at the marketing communications director, or even the CEO, allow this? or order this to happen, then it's, it's, it's a dubious uh, practice. It's, it's very, very risky and short-term thought. And yes, you Absolutely. will be found out, and today not only found out, but talked about on a global basis. To wrap up our conversation, let's quickly focus on this book. Um, and also, if you're interested in the other books uh, by Bernard Bauhofer, they are still available, and you'll find the links and the names also in the description of this video on my YouTube channel. So Corona Insights for Life, Bernard. That was, when I read it, first of all, one thing comes through about you personally, you love music, you're a musician, you sing, and uh, you know, every of these little insights that you included in this book starts with a quote of a song, some lyrics. And there's a couple of things I really, that struck me apart from great book. Um, security is an illusion. And 
you say a security is an illusion and then you say as a society and as an individual we will have to redefine our security requirements and develop new security system personal mindfulness discipline as well as self-protection and protecting of our fellow human beings from ourselves take on a new meaning what's the new meaning well the new meaning is really that um we are not 100% safe. I think we were, we had the illusion that um, we have a bodyguard, we have a security system in our house, we have um, our computers and our, our software protected uh, by any intrusion. Um, we think uh, health security is giving us um, the mental, physical security and safety. And we see that little virus, which is not visible, is attacking us, it's changing our world over time, it's changing the way we're doing business, it's changing, we are communicating with each other, we're creating each other. Um, and, and this uh, has shows, and you mentioned the term before, we are extremely vulnerable. Vulnerable as individuals, as companies. Um, and, and you know, and the thing is, this is, now the big question is, do we go try to go back to the status quo before uh, the COVID-19 crisis or we are learning from this? This means, do we keep distance? Do we, um, the way we talk with each other, the, the way we treat each other if with respect and tolerance um, towards minorities, to, towards other opinions, is this something we really learn and intrinsically are convinced we want to do that or do we go on like this? Um, it has a huge impact, I'm quite sure, about um, the, corp the way we do our business, uh, corporate affairs and uh, the corporate environment. We already see that people don't want to return um, to their working places. And remember, the big companies like Google, uh, like Swatch here in Switzerland, built for hundreds of millions new headquarters, and they are now almost abandoned. We see the drastic change of how we are living, how we are conducting business. Though it's for safety and precautionary measures, but also from a different attitude, right? Um, and uh, we have to protect ourselves, we have to protect our business, and we have to be more mindful in how, we, how we're living our lives. Yeah, um, then everything that we the do does have a One of the big lessons I, I personally take away from, that, from this uh, crisis, which is unfortunately still very active, right? Very active and more active. So as we speak with the numbers still going up rather than continuing to go down. Bernard, now the last question I pose that to every guest on my show. What would you say are the three key learnings, insights you want to pass on to anybody that is thinking about reputation management in a proactive way? Um, first of all, is um, if you are an employee, I, I would suggest really be very critical um, and inform, informed about who, with whom you want to work, or would like to work with them. Um, you have a personal reputation. Does the, the company you are working with uh, really comply with your beliefs, with your ethical principles, with your values? Is it just for money you're going there, or really believe in the purpose of this company? And second. Be very cautious um, what you're doing um, with everything you're doing or not doing, you are impacting your reputation, right? Um, if you say, listen, I don't care about what's going on in the world. Uh, um, I don't care. This is not my business. This means not, you're not necessarily a responsible person uh, as a global citizen, right? And finally, I would say, like, um, it's important that... Um, the perception of other people is, is, is key, of course, because it impacts your, uh, the way you're being perceived, the, 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 the opportunities you have, and, and so forth. But be true to yourself, live your life, try to live a happy life, despite all uh, the complexity of our, of our world, about the pressure from outside, and, and one has to be focused on his or her own life key principles and, and just try to be happy and, and make a career be happy and have a, a balanced life. That's the only thing which I have learned over time. Uh, I was a corporate, um, um, I was a corporate manager and I, I understood, I learned a lot, but uh, being an entrepreneur myself, being independent brings risks, brings huge challenges, but at the same time, a great feeling of that you're doing the right thing. Yeah. And, and you're being authentic with what you do. 
And that's a really key point I think you mentioned just now as your first insight is, you know, if you have certain values, make sure they're aligned with the values of the company that you work for, because that kind of dissidence can really cause even, you know, physical harm to yourself if you're not feeling good, if you need to do something or you're being forced to do something which does not really feel right in your guts. And at the end of the day, what is a company? It's a company. The company is nothing else but a bunch of people doing something and whatever they do as the little, you know, uh, parts of the company will represent the overall and there needs to be a total uh, alignment and it's not all about money. It's all about money, but um, it's, it's very, very easy to, for me to, to say this because I have gone through this career path. I have enjoyed it at all the privileges a manager has in an in, in the international company. Um, and, uh, and of course, if you are hungry as a young talent, you want to have this as well. You want to make money, you want to make a career. Um, but I think the choice is now much bigger. You can really, if you've got the talent and you've got the, 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 the career um, um, uh, requirements, um, prerequisites to really um, to, to, to work with all companies, you really have to pick the right one. Just be, be sensitive, be, um, yeah, be really look behind the wall, look behind what they are saying they are supposed to be and look at the reality. And now, com contrary, uh, contrary to what my time when I was starting my career, I didn't have the all the information people now have. And one has to now with, um, with all the conviction, try to pick the right company and, and, uh, and ideally work there long term and, and, and just look at the purpose personal purpose, the company's purposes, and a purpose, and he said, make sure this is aligned with each other. Beautiful, beautiful. And let me end with a quote talking about, you know, get informed, as you were just saying, and make sure you've got the information. And that is a quote by an anonymous, but I thought it really wraps up our conversation very well, Bernard. Unexpected crisis can destroy businesses and reputation, Boards, chief executives, and their managers may believe they have a firm grip on the risk they face, they should think again. So with that, thank you so much, Bernard, for joining me here on Mentor. Uh, I personally, as usual from you, <laughs> learn a lot. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Patricia. It was a great pleasure. And thank you again, dear Mentor Interior TV community. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Bernard Bauhofer. You will find all the links to what he does, to his books on my YouTube channel. If you did like it, if you enjoy what we are putting out with Mentor TV, make sure to like and also make sure to be subscribed so you are not losing out on any of the videos we are putting out in future. So I hope I see you soon again.